But today we will focus on Grzegorz and our um, cryo EM structures. So Grzegorz is a solid state physicist turned into a structural biologist. So he started his he did his PhD with Matthias Butler in Warsaw in IMCB, developing computational methods for X-ray crystallography. Then he moved, I think, one floor up in the same building to join Janusz Buinicki, and this is where wow. I met Grzegorz. <laughs> Was it one or two? Two floors down. Two, ah, two floors <laughs> down, okay. Uh, to, so he joined Janusz Buinicki to work on uh, computational methods for nucleic acid crystallography and bioinformatics, uh, co-authoring methods like RNA bricks, brickworks, and RNA masonry. Then he moved to EMBL Ham Hamburg, to work with Victor Lanzin. Uh, this is where he has made contribution to the crystal structure modeling building suit ARP -PARP, and adapted it to the automated interpretation of cryo EM reconstructions. And he is now in EMBL Hamburg. So he builds models of macromolecules into crystallographing and cryo EM maps and develop new methods to make his and others work less of a hassle. In particular, he's interested in application of machine learning to the problem of identification, assignment, and validation of protein and nucleic acid in crystallography and cryo -EM. And I believe today we'll learn more about his tools. So Grzegorz, the floor is yours. Thanks, I will share the screen now. I need to unshare yours first. Oh, sorry. Ah, yeah. it's yours. <laughs> Okay, yeah, so I'll be talking about uh, model validation and errors predominantly. So now I, 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 I'm a modeler myself. So I, I build uh, models, I deposit models, crystal structure, if I, um, I analyze them. And I'm scared of errors. It's easy to make errors and not all of them are easy to spot. And today I'll be talking about software I developed specifically to address problems that I was very scared of. And I wanted to have automated program that can help me to avoid them and, uh, and fix, of course. And, uh, and, and um, the first part of my talk will be mostly devoted to proteins. I've been talking quite a lot about the proteins. I have good reason for that. I know they don't want to hear about RNAs and maybe DNA, nucleic acids, but uh, it's quite important to start with proteins because first of all, there's lots of them. So I guess most of you would like to have uh, uh, or develop uh, deep neural network software for predicting RNA structures. Uh, tools like that exist. Tools like that exist for proteins already, and they make uh, they exist because there's lots of protein models available in PDB, experimental ones, good and bad models, and because they exist, it's also quite easy to validate existing models. So we sort of can make us a cycle. So we use existing models to train new deep neural network methods uh, that can be then used to validate the models. So I can quite easily show you what kind of errors are in deposited models, how they can be fixed. And then I will extrapolate this uh, to the, the nucleic acids when the uh, model validation is uh, um, almost non-existent in PDB. There's lots, of, there's lots of errors in RNA structures in deposited models and their validation is, is simply very, very difficult. Okay, so I'm not sure if you know this uh, this model quite uh, uh, proposed quite a long time ago in 18th century by uh, uh, Otto von Gericke. So it, usually when people face it, they, they just make fun of it because it's funny, right? It's completely ridiculous. There's, there's no money much like that. There's so many things bad in this model that it's just impossible. But on the other hand, the guys that uh, build the models and popularized that really great scientists in their time. So Otto von Gericke was something like an experimental physicist, so Magdeburg experiment, and uh, Leibniz was just um, everything. And still they came up with something like, like, like this. They made an uh, obvious error. And the reason was that they simply knew very, very little about the, uh, about the, uh, uh, extinct animals. If they knew that uh, something like uh, mammoth or rhino existed, it would be much easier for them to, be, to come up with a correct model. So simply a priori knowledge was missing here. And that's maybe the first thing I'll be talking about. So how one can uh, make uh, gross errors building macromolecular models. And uh, I will show you the examples that uh, models like this really do exist uh, in PDB. And the other issue is, uh, when the overall quality of the model is okay, it looks 
fine, but there are some hiccups, random errors that are not very serious, but still can, uh, can affect the interpretation of the model. So there will be random errors, minor ones, but can be also as disturbing as uh, gross errors. So first of all, uh, gross errors. So this will be the uh, overall sequence assignment of the model, because usually, at, at least nowadays, it's quite difficult to come up with a model that uh, even cryem or crystallography with completely wrong fault. But it turns out it's quite easy to come up with a model with wrong sequence. And there are examples like that in TDD, because it's not validated at all before the deposition. So uh, it happened that I, I worked for a while on the, on the reverse problem. So identification of unknown uh, proteins uh, given crystal structure or cryogen data. And uh, of course, it's not a new problem, at least in crystallography. People crystallize uh, proteins from natural sources and, and, and identify them from the diffraction data for, for many, many years. But it was usually a manual work. And I automatized the, 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 the process. So I developed a program called Find My Sequence, a very simple machine learning tool. I'm not going into details because uh, there's another tool devoted to nucleic acids. Uh, I will talk uh, in detail about. Uh, the most important thing is that uh, it's based on uh, two uh, base. Uh, coming back to the problem of the identification of the sequences or reverse to the validation, I will, I will turn out uh, soon. So it was a, a first problem find my sequence. So this was a protein, were very, very, very complex and interesting story sort over many, many years. And then uh, uh, that basically shows how the method works. So first initial MR solution with a brute force micro replacement will be substitute the known similar protein, not very important for the stock. And then uh, we can uh, use this kind of messy map to identify uh, the, the, the correct sequence. So the important thing is that this approach is very sensitive. So uh, for scoring, I use uh, Hammer E-value, and it turns out it's very sensitive to the minuscule differences in the sequences of different sequence variants, which is very important for the validation purpose. So in this case, there, there are six different variants of this uh, of this protein, uh, all of them known. And uh, the, the, the difference in the E-value between the top score and the next one is, is quite substantial. So it's quite easy to identify very minuscule differences. And it also works very well for, for CryEM. And that's another example with uh, Panos Kasuitis lab. So Panos is an expert of uh, aquarium of native cell extracts so can, can purify and reconstruct the uh, the protein protein uh, proteins from the uh, protein maps from, from the native cell extracts. But of course, since it, he purifies them directly from the grid, he doesn't know the identity of the of the proteins. And and uh, find my sequence helped him to in one of the projects when he had four different targets. And what is very interesting here that for one of the targets at quite low resolution uh, for the for the uh, uh, according to modern standards, uh, those are the hydrogenase with two different sequence variants with uh, quite low sequence identity. So basically random one. And they uh, basically formed almost exactly the same tertiary structure. So what I did, I, I predicted both models with alpha fold, fitted them in code to the, to the map, which looked like that. So I think you agree with me that it's uh, from our perspective, it's featureless. But for find my sequence, there's enough information in this kind of model to identify the correct sequence, regardless which uh, model, backbone model was actually used. So it's it's very, very, very sensitive and very powerful, even in cases when the sequence is not very obvious. So that's where the idea of using that for identification of sequences for the validation uh, uh, basically was uh, started. So, uh, but if it works so well on the, for complete proteins, so it maybe also can be used for the validation of local sequence assignment. So the idea is again, very, very simple. So one takes a backbone model from existing model, small fragment of it, generates this uh, footprint of uh, residue probabilities using a machine learning uh, classifier, and then tries to identify the most plausible assignment to the target sequence, which is in this case already known. And there are a few different uh, scenarios. So first of all, p-value, all the probability of the new assignment is random, can be close to one, so basically know nothing. That's perfectly fine, uh, as long as we can uh, have reliable p-value estimate. Now, if the p-value is relatively small, more about that in a moment, then can, can be two different uh, cases. So first of all, the new sequence assignment by the procedure can be the same as in the model, then most probably the sequence of the model is correct, 
or the two can be different. And this is most probably uh, error in sequence assignment in the, in the source model, because we basically can propose a better hypothesis about the sequence assignment. And uh, now it's a very important question, how reliable this score is. Because of course it's you know the, the, the crime maps can be very very messy and they, there's also issue of local resolution. So in a large reconstruction in the core resolution can be very very high, but on the periphery uh, can be very very low or the, in orders of magnitude lower than in the in the core of the reconstruction. And it uh, turns out that this class, this approach has a very peculiar feature. So it's re local resolution independent basically. So for the sequences. When the sequence, new sequence and the sequence of the model agree with each other, then the p-value goes up with the local resolution. So this is negative logarithm of the p-value. So the higher the value uh, of the of the axis, the lower p-value is, right? So it goes down with the local resolution, which is obvious because the information content of the map goes down. But if the sequence differs, so the sequence assignment process assigns something different than the actual model uh, sequence in the model, then there is no resolution dependence. So we are ruling out one of the parameters. And in this kind of uh, tests, it's always good to look at the outliers. So the circles here show a very peculiar case of a structure where p-value is very, very low, right? It's this part. But the sequence, newly assigned sequence by, the, by this approach, but find my sequence is different than the sequence in the model. So it's a potential error. So let's have a look at this. Uh, so that's a uh, uh, mm, cation channel structure, three point action resolution, pretty old one built manually by hand, uh, I think 10 years ago already. One of the very first high resolution structures in, 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 in CryEM. And that's how the model looks like. So that's the deposit coordinates. And that's a corresponding fragment of the Alphold model with high PLDDT fitted to the exactly the same region of the of the map. So I think you agree again with me that it's mm, not very intuitive which one is correct or better uh, compared to, to the other. And what you see below, the, the, the bars correspond to the negative logarithm of the p-values for the consecutive overlapping fragments of the model. And uh, what you see here, the red ones, is exactly where the, the, the procedure identified kind of possible error. So the p-value is low, and still the new sequence is different than the sequence in the model, right? So it turns out that this uh, new sequence proposed by this approach agrees with the alpha fault uh, hypothesis. And also it's uh, much better than the, than the Q score that's now available in, in PDB and probably many of you use it for validating the structure. So nothing against the Q score, but the problem with this Q score is that it's resolution dependent. And sometimes it's difficult to compare the uh, low and high resolution regions, local resolution regions in the same model using a uh, threshold that is defined for the global resolution, exactly as in, like in this case. So maybe this plot really looks a bit worse than this one, but it's very, very difficult to, to identify any uh, issues based on this, right? So it's not uh, significantly worse in this region when there's a register shift error than in this region. So it's it shows that, uh, that this new approach really provides some additional information. So this is basically the, the, the idea of program called Check My Sequence that developed. So it was first uh, developed for proteins. Now it works also for nucleic acids. So it's, it's fully generic and uh, works on also on a very, uh, uh, in a very specific way. More about that in a moment. So it's designed to reduce the amount of information that it passed to the user, which can be very interesting for you, I guess, because it doesn't produce doesn't produce uh, long tables of scores, but just raises an alarm that something is wrong. For example, you cannot identify the, sequ uh, the sequence of a fragment of the model found register shift uh, uh, point mutation and so on and so forth. Okay, I will just show you very, one very simple example. That's how it looks, uh, the output looks like. An example, for example, we use this one. So this is a, a protein complex, quite large one. So uh, almost 20 megadalton. It was released by accident earlier this year. Uh, it was published afterwards. So I think that, that it, it, it raised mo most more attention when it was released ac accidentally than it, when it was uh, published later on, because people noticed, wow, it's really huge. So Panos, for example, noticed that the PDB validation report is almost 7,000 pages. 
it's not something you can really use for validation, right? So it's uh, you can make a joke of that, but it's not useful information because it's simply too large. Tristan noticed that uh, in his style that uh, to validate the model in just one second at the residue, it will take a few uh, two days for him. So it's all again uh, prohibitively long. So my answer was, okay, you check my sequence and in 40 minutes, you will get a few interesting cases. And he wasn't really uh, impressed and said, oh, there are problems with, uh, with the model fitting, with the magnification, blah, blah, blah. So I sent him the, uh, the, the validation report from check my sequence. And then uh, he was a bit more impressed with that. Whoops. Okay. And now we just show you the examples of the model, of the, of the modeling carols that uh, check my sequence identified in this, in this model. And it's very important because and that's, uh, that's uh, one of the reasons why I'm showing this example, because uh, check my sequence is based on machine learning classifier. You use machine learning tools, so I know what's the major problem. So it's the generalization. And uh, in this case, uh, we are facing a huge problem. So a uh, huge model possibly generating lots of false positives, but it turns out it's not the case. So uh, find my check my sequence that defined only a few errors in this model, and all of them are uh, true errors, are not false positives. So first of all, several issues like this one. So this protein looks okay-ish, but it's shifted out of density. So it's a problem of magnification, refinement, difficult to say. So refinement of this one in cooled in, 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 in one minute with self-restraints fixes the problem, but it simply couldn't be done because of the large, uh, because of the size of the structure. And then there are a few interesting ones. So for example, put this one, transferbin helix, that's a deposited model when uh, check my sequence divide a problem. And, uh, and it turns out that it's not a regular helix because there's a proline over there. It, this fragment is in, five pi, in fact pi helix because it's a pi helix with larger radius. It introduces register shift downstream of this fragment, which is not the case in the deposited model. It's also not the case in our thought prediction. So the, basically the radius of this pi inclusion is uh, it's too small to, in, to, to, to result in a register shift. So in, 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 a, in corrected model, I think it was much better in, including the proline that should uh, follow directly the pi helix inclusion. Uh, this is another example, uh, which I will show you just to, to, uh, to give an example of problems when that cannot be easily addressed with, uh, with AlphaFold. So this is a protein. That's how it looks like in the deposited model. There's an insertion over there that again resulted in register shift in a massive part of the of the protein. And uh, this the prediction is not good enough to fix this. So even though the error can be identified, it's not trivial to fix it. It's lots of manual work uh, to get the correct solution. And it won't be possible to avoid the error by simply using cutthroat prediction for building the model. Okay, uh, what about then crystal structures? So the, the major difference between the crystal structures and cryogenic structures is that uh, in uh, crystal structures, one needs to use the phases calculated from the uh, initial model to calculate them up. So there's a uh, uh, chicken problem, or so-called model bias. So it's not that obvious that uh, by using the standard uh, maps that you can download from PDB, for example, but from any refinement program, you can really get any information about errors in the model, right? Because this is simply a biased information by the, by the current model. But by using exactly the same procedure, it turns out that it works pretty well. I will show you only one example just to prepare you for the uh, crystallographic maps that I will talk a bit, uh, register shift that uh, the program identified in a, in a ribosomal protein. And the problem here is that this fragment of the, of the chain is mistraced, it's simply too short. And that resulted in the uh, register shift in this fragment of the protein. So you can see, first of all, the so-called maximum likelihood uh, composite map, which is blue one. So the best approximation of the, of the real map that you can get from the data and the difference density map. So difference density map shows where there's an excess uh, scattering in the model, too much of, the, of too many atoms, or when something is missing. So you can clearly see this in the deposited uh, map, but think of the size of the model. It's uh, just few atoms missing in this monster. So it's really a needle in the haystack 
and it would be very, very difficult to identify without having this kind of software. But still, the information is there. So the maps are good enough uh, to identify and fix the problem if you know where to look. OK, so uh, now about general uh, comment about the quality of the structure. So I did a very quick scan. We've checked my sequence of the proteins, proteins uh, structures between two and three angstrom resolution from PDB. And so this uh, creme de la creme of the of the protein structure. So that's exactly what what, what uh, DeepMind used to, to, to generate alpha fold uh, classifiers, right? Because it's they're supposed to be the best ones. And it turns out there's quite a lot of issues with them, including almost one percent of the structures with uh, very plausible register sheets. So it's still even though one of one, um, even though one percent uh, of the of the models have very clear errors. The, the overall set is good enough to train good quality uh, structure prediction classifier, which is, I think, quite uh, good information. Still, the presence of those models can be quite harmful for the, uh, for the future, and they should be addressed at some point. And most of them can be addressed with the, with the existing uh, alpha fault like tools. I will not talk about that, but uh, if you want, I can show you examples at the end. Okay, so now I will switch to the nucleic acids. So uh, that's a fragment of a crystal structure of uh, 28S, uh, 2.8 angstrom resolution, so pretty good resolution, and there's a catch in there. So one of them has a completely random sequence. Can you identify which one is that? But it was randomized in a tricky way. So I randomized the sequence in a way that it preserved the secondary structure, which means that I could take the model, uh, generate the secondary structure restraints, and uh, automatically refine it to get uh, pretty good quality maps. It just it doesn't explode. So, do you have any ideas which one is that? Of course, it's better if, if I could. It would be better if I could see you uh, face to face. But uh, so you can just think about that. So uh, probably you notice this purine over there. So this sticks out of the density because it's wrong, right? So, but yeah, yeah, but Janus, regardless, Janus, it's, that, that's it's, the one on the right is bad. So Janus was the right. red one. <laughs> ah, because you, you okay. Someone yeah, in the chat, oh, yeah, great. in the chat, yeah, said in the chat. Yeah, but it's still. I think you agree with me that it's not obvious which one is correct. So I selected fragment of the model when you can really see this, uh, but on the other hand, there's a fragment uh, when they are all there. So position of this uh, purine is wrong. That's why there's this uh, this uh, different density peak over there. So there's lots of errors in this uh, fragment of RNA, and uh, it's not trivial to identify them, correct them, and even to say which uh, whether the sequence is correct or not. So uh, the, the major problem is that, that with this kind of information, uh, you cannot really say uh, two different types of purines and pyrimidines from each other, right? So if you are lucky enough, uh, in most of the cases, you can distinguish purines from pyrimidines, but that's all. And you need to leave this information to validate the sequence. And this information needs to be compensated somehow. So the, the approach that I, that I used to compensate for that was the secondary structure information. So it turns out that it's possible to identify the secondary structure, so the base pairing information, without using uh, bases in the first place. So I developed a very simple uh, algorithm that just takes fragments of uh, RNA or DNA with known secondary structure and matches them to the target uh, structure. And based on that, so basically exclusively based on the uh, conformation of the backbone, uh, it identifies plausible uh, base pairing. And it turns out it works pretty well. So I've just spent a while on this, on this plot now. So first, canonical base pairs, which is most probably most trivial ones. So what it shows here, it shows basically how the algorithm works because it's not that trivial. It just takes the pool of the models and then and, and, and fits them to the, to the targets. So first of all, it takes the short, short stems. And I was testing whether the length of the stem uh, that it's used for the first uh, step in the procedure matters or not. So it turns out that uh, with uh, a bit shorter stems, only with two base pairs, so basically two stacked base pairs, uh, the procedure works best. That would be the zero point where only stems are used. The one point is when up and when instead and, and on top of the first run with the with the stems, the method also uses the non-standard uh, recurrent motifs of RNA. So, for example, uh, loops and 
or uh, or uh, distorted uh, public vehicle fragments. In terms of it helps a lot. So the, the maximum performance uh, you can get with this approach when only very short helices are used first, identify the canonical base person. This is complemented with the relatively small pool of the uh, of the most popular non uh, helical fragments uh, of RNA. So there's only 83 of them that is generated, selected using uh, uh, RNA Bricks database. And uh, the performance is also quite, I, I think, pretty good given the general idea of the, of the procedure. So the precision is over almost 98% with recall of uh, 92%. With, and it also works for non clinical base, but it's not important for the stock, but still it can be used for that. Then, of course, the performance is much worse because it requires lots of uh, different RNA motifs to identify the, the base pairing, but it still somehow works and the precision is pretty, pretty, pretty good. Okay. And how yeah, this so information can be. Uh, Rita yeah. does, has a question. I don't know. I can read it. How is precision evaluated here? Sequence identity? uh no it's just the just, just, just the correctness of the of the, of the assignment of the, of the base pairing it's only the base pair classifier is it fine or thanks i'm not really sure <laughs> yeah i think radio is it's Oh, thanks. Okay. In so, the chat. Uh, I don't know if you can see the okay. chat. It's only about the base pairing classification, nothing else. <laughs> okay. Uh, now, how this information can be used? So, that's basically the, the diagram that shows the workflow of the, of the Dado Helix program. That's basically a nucleic identification, sequence identification procedure, like find my sequence. But on top of that, uh, that can identify the sequence, it just uh, generates some information that can be useful. Uh, or for a model being like the like the base pairing information restraints. So on the input, the program takes the uh, the map and the model. Uh, based on that, it generates the footprint of the uh, of the sequence, but only on the purine and pyrimidine level. So it completely ignores different types of purines and pyrimidines. So the sequence information is reduced. Then using this recurrent uh, motif matching procedure, generates a secondary structure, and then all of that. It's uh, used to generate the covariance model, and this is uh, fed to Infernal to do the sequence assignment. I will show you how it works on a, on a very simple example. But first, I will uh, show you how really the uh, the secondary assignment works. So this uh, uh, RNA model built with ARPOR. <laughs> I work on ARPOR for quite a while, so I know what it can do occasionally. So the problem here is that uh, at lower resolutions. Uh, the program cannot, uh, after initial tracing of the backbone model, cannot really properly refine the basis. And it comes up with something like this. And the problem is that uh, basically you can, you can do nothing with that, right? Because no program uh, like EBG, Phoenix, or Resolve that can generate restraints for that. But if you look at that from the proper angle and use your imagination, you should notice that this is a double helical fragment, canonical one. And this can be restrained with double helix because the double helix uses the, the backbone information to generate the restraints. And the backbone, it, it's uh, roughly 60% of the scattering power of nucleotides, which basically means that uh, if anything, the backbone should be properly positioned after the refinement. But the basis most often will look like the, in a blue model. So this approach can be very, very useful and quite powerful. Of course, this was an extreme case, uh, but it can also be used for fixed wheel problems. So this is the RNA polymerase. I exploited uh, cryo model, quite important one for several reasons, not only because it's important structure, but it's also had a very interesting uh, protein register shift over there. That was discussed in, I think, five or six papers already, because people train different methods of uh, in, uh, identifying that and fixing this. But it also has a problem, most probably, in the model of the RNA fragment, because this fragment of RNA is most probably double helical, and that's something that uh, double helix can grasp. So that's the model, how it looks like with the edge-bound restraints, hydrogen bond restraints generated with Isolde uh, in the deposited model. That's how what uh, 
double helix thinks the restraints should look like, and that's the refined model. So even though the resolution of this fragment is quite low, uh, I think you agree with me that this hypothesis uh, of the secondary structure is uh, much more plausible than the original one, and still quite difficult to, to, to identify. Okay, so now how the identification of the sequences in kernel works. So again, using a very simple example of cryium uh, structure, this uh, 28S uh, fragment at three actual resolution, the secondary structure diagram, and that's how the, the structure looks like in the map. So it's a pretty well resolved. So what uh, W3 generates is this kind of consensus. So it, it fits the infernal with the information about the uh, plausibility of the purines and pyrimidines only, and the secondary structure identified using backbone uh, only. And then depending on the local quality of the map, the, the, the quality of the information, so the, uh, the reliability of the, of the uh, base type classification can be low, like in this case, or pretty high, like in this case. But in fact, this is a base part, the base part that involves this uh, purine and, and, uh, and, and, and pyrimidine from here that is identified with a uh, much lower probability. So it is not that obvious from the map what classifier will do. Still, it is pretty good to, uh, to generate the, res the, the correct result. So I will again use the example of the randomized uh, ribosome from the, from the, from the two slides uh, back. And uh, so that's how the identification of, uh, of, of, of sequences looks like in uh, works in uh, crystal structures with randomized sequences. So the uh, map that uh, it's most plausible given the, the real case scenario when re someone really tries to identify the, the sequence and uh, basically shows that the E value that uh, infernal returns for, uh, for this fake input works pretty well. And uh, it's quite easy to identify, to, to distinguish the correct and wrong sequence. So also the, the, the uh, robustness of the approach is quite high. With the EM structure, the story is a bit different because usually the, the, the resolutions are a bit lower and, uh, and the fragments used for identification is to be also quite high. So uh, this basically shows how the uh, covariance models or the information from the, uh, of the secondary structure base pairing information improves the performance of the approach. So the green curve, it's a hidden Markov model approach, so ignoring secondary structure information on the, on the classification of the base pairs. And uh, the blue one is exactly the same length of the fragments used for the identification of the sequence, but with the secondary structure information. And uh, at lower resolutions, these are not stunning, but uh, quite significant difference. But the major difference, of course, comes from the uh, from the number of, 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 uh, of bases used for identification. So the longer the fragments are, uh, the higher the probability that the correct sequence will be identified. And again, the, like in case of the, of, the, of the crystal structures, the E value is a pretty good uh, uh, score that tells the correct from, uh, from wrong solutions. Okay, so now uh, I'm very, very briefly show how the, how the approach works and show you just few examples because I guess I need to wrap up. So that's basically the, the variant of uh, check my sequence for the, for the uh, for nucleic acids. So instead of standard backbone model, it uses on the, the, the base pairing information and the footprint of the sequence reduced to the purines and pyrimidines. Otherwise, all the p-values and the uh, models of around is exactly the same. Uh, okay, and then uh, instead of e-value that it's used for identification of the sequences, the p-value it's used for scoring the newly, newly assigned sequences, and it uh, also works uh, pretty well. I will not talk much about that. And again, like in case of proteins, uh, this score is not doesn't depend on the local resolution in cryogenic structures, which is a very important feature because it's ruling basically out one of the three parameters that are difficult to, to assess. And again, like in case of proteins, there's an outlier. I will show you in more detail now because I think that's the most interesting. So basically, this is a, a set of hits from the benchmark set with very, very low p-value, but the newly assigned sequence by the procedure different than the sequence in the model. So the, the circles uh, correspond to this uh, fragment of the uh, expansion 
a segment in my Magian ribosome at 3.4 angstrom resolution. So the structure was deposited in 2014, so early uh, days of the high resolution cry EM, but still the map is pretty good. And there are errors, issues like this, which are not easy to spot because there are not that many of them. For some reason, there are just a few uh, bases that stick out of the density. And then is it an error or not? So let's have a look what check my sequence can uh, say about that. So that's the uh, report of check my sequence. So it suggests that the two strands of the double helical fragment from the previous plot are shifted by one residue in opposite directions, uh, which turns out to be more or less correct. But the problem is how we can validate this kind of information. So that's how the corrected model looks like after shifting the the the, uh, the change by one residue in opposite directions. This it fits much better, and it also uh, fits much better the reference structure because it turns out that there's a reference structure, higher resolution model deposited after. Uh, this one with all exactly with strictly conserved uh, sequence in this very region of the so called expansion segment. And that's the secondary structure plot, which is uh, brings a bit uh, more important information. So, the, on the very lowest uh, line row, there's a, a sequence of, of this of fragment shown on, on the top from the original, original deposited model and the, the arcs show the secondary structure identified by the uh, by double helix from the backbone conformation on in the double helical regions and uh, i think you can i hope you can see on the on this graph that there's lots of violations of the of the base pairing so in the double helical regions where there's expected uh, canonical base pair mm -hmm. there's uh, there are residues that simply do not, do not allow for that and this can be corrected uh, by shifting the residues, as I just explained. And this ag agrees exactly with the reference uh, rabbit fragment, a uh, fragment of the, of the rabbit ribosome. Yeah. So now where the error comes from, because I think that's also quite interesting case. As I said at the beginning, it's not that easy to spot errors in RNA models, and it's not that easy to fix them. And it's also, also quite interesting to see, to check where the errors come from. And this one has a quite peculiar story. So this structure was solved, as I said, in, in early days of uh, high resolution cryem, but there were the, quite a few structures of, of ribosomes available that could be used as a templates. So bacterial and uh, the, there were two crystal structures of uh, bacterial and eukaryotic ribosomes used as a templates for building the model, but some regions had to be built from scratch. And most importantly, this region, that it's a uh, so-called expansion segment of ribosomal RNA, which is probably the only uh, fragment of ribosomal RNA that's highly variable between different organisms. Otherwise, it's very highly conserved. So the guys who built the model had to go for assemble RNA faults, uh, secondary structure prediction, and could for really quite tedious, I, I guess, uh, building of this model into five function resolution map. And then this model was used uh, by the authors of the mammalian ribosomes I just showed you to explain their density. And they made, and they, as fortunately, they repeated the mistake from the original structure. So it's difficult to guess what went wrong in this structure, but it's easy to imagine that something could have gone wrong at this resolution. And this simply uh, wasn't noticed in the higher resolution uh, structure, unfortunately. And uh, th this kind of error propagation uh, can happen. And uh, as far as I can say, it's quite common in, uh, in, uh, in ribosome structures. OK, one, uh, another example, a uh, more trivial one. So that's just sequence alignment of the model derived and the target sequence. And what you can see here at, uh, in this ribosome structure, that 3.5 angstrom uh, cry a model of eukaryotic ribosome, there are these fancy gaps over there. So the question is, is it a missing residue over there? So it's not, it's a deletion, doesn't shift. Okay, and uh, the, the, the corresponding fragment of the, of the model looks like this. And uh, the problem is that this interpreted density that obviously corresponds to the, the missing base. And this is a, uh, and this is what uh, resulted in a uh, problem in the sequence alignment that you've that seen before. But it's not so trivial to fix because the problem is that this purine doesn't belong to this fragment of the density, but to the uh, one on the top. And the missing one is 
indeed in this region. So it requires some, some thinking to get the source of the problem and, and to correct it, even though the source of the problem is most probably quite trivial. That's another one, uh, nucleosome at pretty high resolution. So that's a, that's a case I, I, I identified by just a random check my sequence scan. So I, I scan with check my sequence most recent uh, structures uh, that are released in, in PDB and sometimes I, I come across this kind of problem. So uh, this one, in this case, check my sequence um, complain that you cannot identify one of the chains of DNA and that's the one. So it cannot identify it because it's simply not matching the density. That's why the, the initial footprinting of the residue types completely fails because it's just in the middle of nowhere. Another problem is the plausible register shift. And that's another uh, uh, chain of the double helical fragment. And that's exactly how it looks like. That's the, that's the region where the register shift was introduced. So unlike the previous example, with the deletion that uh, didn't affect the register shift of the uh, of the model. In this case, this uh, issue, this this, this uh, model building issue, introduces register shift that can be identified with uh, with check my sequence pretty good scores. And this is very recent structure. I think it was uh, released uh, very early this year. Uh, okay, and now. Uh, mm, uh, my favorite one. So uh, crystal structure of bacterial ribosome at 3.5 times resolution. So uh, this is a pretty nice structure. The scores are usually not perfect on you know, the sliders when you look at them in PDB, but since the ribosomes are huge and difficult to refine. So that's not nothing very worrying. Uh, but uh, uh, for this specific uh, ribosome, check my sequence complains a lot about uh, several issues, about two proteins and one uh, RNA fragment. So I will uh, skip proteins. Uh, should not talk too much about them. And then let's have a look at, the, at this RNA fragment. So it turns out that uh, it complains about the uh, long fragment of the 5S uh, ribosomal RNA. And that's the fit to the density of the fragment highlighted here by the circle. So we see that something is wrong, right? So the red density basically means that there's too many, that there's too many atoms in this region. So most probably that should be purine, uh, pyrimidine. And over there, there's a purine that most probably should be a pyrimidine. Something is wrong over there. But the problem is that the check my sequence uh, result suggests that there's a, a problem with the backbone tracing. There's a deletion. But the backbone looks perfectly fine in this case. And it took me a while to find the source of the problem. So it turns out, that the sequence of this 5S uh, chain is completely wrong. And it's not obvious to me what's the source of the problem. So I use double helix identification mode to search the uh, uh, genomic RNA sequence databases. And I found that it is for this specific organism that two different uh, variants of 5S sequence, which should not be the case, right? It's a bacterial ribosome. In bacterial ribosomes, there is no 5S polymorphism. But for some reason, there are two sequences in database. And the authors of this uh, structure used the wrong one. That resulted in the in a quite massive uh, register shift in this part of the uh, of the chain. And also after fixing the problem, the problems, not only the, 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 the quite obviously seen problems with the fit to the density disappear, but also the overall quality of the secondary structure improves. Right, so that's basically many more base pairings that uh, that of, is of course expected for this kind of compact structures, and this can be also seen on this on on the graph here. So uh, so the, that's a deposited sequence uh, that results in lots of uh, invalid base pairing. Uh, I'll show one on the on the next plot, like this one, for example. So the deposit one is the black one. So I do two pyrimidines. This should be pyrimidine, pyrimidine and double helical fragment, but it's not the deposited model. And uh, the simple sequence alignment of the deposited sequence variant with the corrected one uh, shows that this is exactly what check my sequence identified. So this is this uh, missing residue uh, that it uh, suggested because the only sequence variant it had in hand uh, was uh, simply wrong. Okay, 
And uh, that's uh, all I wanted to, to, to say. So I just basically to recapitulate, I wanted just to show you that there's, there can be lots of issues in the in the PDB that uh, are basically not validated at the moment, right? But uh, you need to be very careful with them. And uh, you can use check my sequence to check the models that uh, for some reason you really, really need to, to use for your uh, in your work. And it's quite a simple program. It's uh, You can get it from GitLab. Uh, it's also almost in CCP4 if you use it. It will be in the next couple of months. WHELIX is also being integrated, but we have, some, we have problems with, uh, with Infernal because there's no Infernal for Windows, native Windows. And we need it because CCP4 needs to be available for all the systems that people use. So this will probably take a bit longer. But check my sequence for proteins and uh, should have it quite soon. But if you don't need to go to the CCP4 path, you can install it straight away with, with Conda uh, from GitLab and it uh, should work quite smoothly. And uh, the convention people that, uh, that um, before I work on the, on the, the projects I was, uh, uh, I was talking about. So uh, Dan and Ronan and, uh, and the guys who crystallized the, the snake binome protein long time ago in Peru <laughs> and ended up uh, on my desk. Yeah, and thank you for listening. I'll be happy to take any questions. Okay, uh, so yeah, we have already one question, and so in the chat, so maybe in the chat you can write Mike at the end, so I will know that you want to speak, I don't know, because that's always an issue, so I think Janusz will like to speak, uh, I have a question. I think Riju's question was first. So Riju asked, how is precision evaluated here, sequence and the identity, thanks. I will have my question after that. Uh, that was during the uh, talk, I think. This yeah, was, yeah, yeah. Uh... Okay, okay. So, uh, so, so my question is, okay, uh, hi, hi, uh, very nice talk. And then very cool method. I, I wasn't aware of it, uh, even though it, it was published in nucleic acid research. I will check it out. My question is, what is the resolution limit? Mostly local. So do you need to see the density for the individual residues? Because, you know, in medium resolution, cryo-EM maps, and maybe also in some you know, bad crystallographic maps, the density is, is almost continuous or just continuous. And the, the only clearly distinguishing feature are the grooves and bumps corresponding to phosphate groups. So I guess this is yeah, already so I, the limit of your method. So what is the limit? What is like the, the worst quality that your method can still work on? And I'm asking this both in terms of both in quantitative terms, like, you know, the, our, the, the, the resolution limit or, qualitative in terms of what kind of features do we need to see in the map to 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 know that your method is likely to help thank you uh okay so that's a very good question of course because uh, as i said at the beginning it's quite difficult to this to the fully automated benchmarks and show you that it's a convincing result that it works up to 10 or so angstrom local resolution so of course it doesn't it has its limitations, but in my hands, the lowest resolution when it works was a rough year, six angstrom, when you can really see the grooves, but not the bases, it's bulky. And uh, as I, that's why I was showing the protein results at the very beginning. So the dehydrogenase case, when they saw, when you can really quite really see the sausages of the, of the helices, but no side chains whatsoever, but still the classifiers can identify enough uh, features of the side chains to, uh, to identify the sequence, but only if you have a complete model. That's the problem. So we cannot rely on fragmented, low quality uh, backbone model. And that's exactly the case for nucleic acids. So if you can, for example, build a long double clinical fragment, like in the case I was uh, referring to. So it was basically double clinical fragment uh, setting over 60 or 80 base pairs. So then the method quite quite nicely generate the, the, the good scores. But if you really need to, to, to trace the model from scratch, lots of non-canonical interactions, loops, and so on, it can be quite difficult. But the good thing is that the p-value is very reliable. So whenever the method is not sure, the p-value will be one. If it's sure, the p-value will be uh, small and small means uh, roughly 0.1 that's the threshold that you need to uh, rely on 
Thanks. We'll definitely try your method uh, before we deposit any models, uh, just to know how far we can be from the from random. Thank you. I hope at some point it will be other way around, so it will be used to validate the models after you deposit. But uh, it's still. <laughs> I uh, prefer to, to evaluate before I deposit, you know, so just to make oh, sure. <laughs> okay, I will read the question from Riju. Will double helix work for non natural designed RNAs? Yeah, of course. So, uh, uh, it, of, it depends, of course, what you, what you need to do. But if you have a reference sequence, it can be natural, can be fully synthetic, it will work quite nicely. So it also, it's also not very sensitive to the modification. So that's what uh, one of the reviewers of the paper requested. So I did uh, quite extensive tests and the modifications not affect the quality of the output. So with that, it should work quite nicely. Okay, so maybe I will ask mine uh, more general. And I think we discussed this even in Warsaw a few times and with Janusz as well. So. You know, is there any, I mean, I, I I remember that there was, and maybe still there is this PDB redo. So there was some in the community, I think, you know, efforts to to fix PDB or like to to find some of the errors and make something because, you know, I think this kind of errors are, you know, pro relatively easy maybe with your tools now to identify, but for people doing uh, you know all the all the work like just downloading the, the models for alpha fold or all this new method of machine learning and so on and so forth they will not be i mean they don't really want to go into all of these things they are not experts at fixing this uh all these errors so is there uh, like something new about this uh this you know in, 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 in yeah, this so this... of fixing pdb or so there is PDB redo, of course. Uh, uh, Robbie Houston from Nonocrit too well, so I know that he's working really hard to uh, to make it more automated, more robust, and so on and so forth. So it's so uh, I think I mentioned that very briefly. So for example, in the case with the randomized sequences, I use PDB redo to refine the model, right? So it's uh, okay. it's a very very robust package. For to, to refine and fix many problems, but it will not solve all the problems. And one of the problems it can will not fix for you is uh, register shifts. At least not not uh, not the most obvious ones, because uh, like most other programs, it most it it is it's focused on tiny issues like uh, different conformations of the base pairs, uh, with conformers. Uh, tracing problems and the register shifts are uh, it's completely different uh, type of problems and this is something that that's that, that's a problem that people realize that exists long long time ago and uh, people keep saying that it's possible to identify them with multiple methods but no method can really say you straight yeah you have register error by one residue and in this residue range you need to fix this so uh so this kind of problems you will not fix with PDB redo, but lots of different issues you can fix with it. Okay. But I also believe that in uh, there is, because I, th I thought uh, PDB redo is also kind of manual. So for example, you now have a list of different errors. So is there anything that you could do with these errors? Like, is there any place to send it back and, you know, will all, uh, you know, benefit from fixed structures or? Yeah, there it's is called like... hooked. <laughs> Or resolved, if you like. Yeah, so it's, uh, I, I don't think uh, there's a way to really fix the, 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 the problems in, uh, in, in deposited models on a large scale. So there was, uh, uh, mm, there, there were a few initiatives to do things like that, like the, the Corona Task Force, for example. Uh, uh, but uh, but it, it's usually the, the, the human effort. So we need to really need to find someone who will uh, help you to fix the problem or fix the problem for you. So there's, I don't think there's, uh, th there's a program that can really fix all the problems that uh, can possibly be encountered. In, uh, no, no, no. So not, I don't even need one program, but I mean like a place or database that you can report these errors and you know that, you know, that's a place when people could fix. Yeah, that's a very good question. So, so, uh, so, I, so for example, we've, we've done, we have a project when uh, we try to analyze the, the, uh, the very large numbers of deposited models. And uh, 
And what we do with errors that we identify, we just uh, send emails to the authors. Sometimes they respond, sometimes they fix the errors, but uh, usually they, they just ignore it. So it's not possible, I think, at the moment to do it in a, in a standard and systematic way. So you need to rely on the validation scores in PDB. You can run check my sequence to see whether there is any serious uh, gross error in the model. But I don't think uh, there is any resource that you can use to get the best quality models available. But of course, in PDB, there are also uh, there are versions of the models, right? So they, if authors decide to, to, to fix errors, to improve the models, the, the, the position will be upgraded. Okay. Any other questions? So it's uh, rather, I think, unfortunately, it means that you need to avoid all models with errors than just to search for the better ones. Yeah, but if the errors are not, you know, even mentioned on PDB, then you just have to do all of this by your own. Janusz? I have a, a question that is like on a topic that is probably far away from what you discussed, but very important for RNA any way to find and check and validate the position of ions, because this is the source of huge errors. And there have been you know, many reports showing that like a huge fraction of the ions and water molecule assignment in, in nucleic acid structures is just wrong. And people put like very stupid assignments which can be validated very, very easily. But some of these are not clear and there are some, tendencies, so the, some of the, uh, the, the placement of, of, of the ions are actually so frequent that, that they, they bias any statistics that we see in the PDB. Have you looked at the position of ions in nucleic acids and do you think your methods could eventually help in fixing these? No, I don't think so, but, I, but uh, because I think that uh, there's quite solid uh, knowledge of chemistry needed for that and uh, PDB Redo is doing pretty well with that respect. So Robbie has uh, several approaches that uses the coordination uh, information to identify the most plausible ions and PDB really does it pretty well. Uh, so I think uh, one can use this as a reference. This so why people reliable. aren't using it? Why are there so many structures with suspicious positions of waters and, and, and ions? Probably misassigned. That's a very good question, right? Because uh, that's quite easy to use. And maybe people just as a skirt of sending the data to the remote server. Maybe they're in a hurry. We don't know that it exists. And there's also lots of different tools that promise uh, much better performance, like a deep learning tools for ion identification. I've seen one a few months back, Nature Metals, I think. But I'm not really sure if this kind of tool uh, can be easily trained based on PDB. I would uh, be very uh, reluctant. This is exactly why I asked this question. So the underlying data is probably not good enough and requires uh, maybe manual, maybe you know, software assisted uh, sifting through. Yeah. Thank you. The only good thing is that now in, in crystal, at least the crystal structures will be much more reliable because now the, the anomalous data is measured uh, and the energy scans are done at most of the beam lines fully automatically and the, most of the crystallographers can really accurately assign the identity of the ions in their uh, in their structures so it changes over time but there's still tens of thousands of structures in PDB of course with uh, plausible errors but I'm not expert with that I, I'm a mere physicist so. <laughs> yeah. all right I think we're over time so we're gonna uh there, there's another question in the Q and A, um, but we're just going to quickly conclude, and then if you can stay on for a couple minutes, we can answer those questions. Um, so, join us in two weeks for a talk by Robin Pierce about deep fold RNA. Um, the recording for this talk will be up in a few days, um, and I think this talk was a great example of kind of uh, new methods that predictors can potentially use to clean up their data sets, for example, um, so they're not training on all these errors. Um, all right, so I think that was the announcement. So for those that had to leave at nine, please feel free to. If you can, Greg, if you can stay on for a couple minutes, there's a couple more questions. Yeah, okay. Uh, so the question is a Q&A. 
um, that is, does this method identify or distinguish canonical and non-canonical interactions in EM maps? Uh, yeah, so it can identify the non-canonical interactions, as I said uh, before. Uh, okay, let me switch to the plot. Uh, so I mostly cared about the canonical ones because I use them for identification of the sequences. But it can identify non-canonical interactions, but it's not as accurate as uh, standard approaches because maybe there's not enough information. And, uh, and you really need to go uh, so there's a, there's a switch in double helix so when you can modify the number of motifs used for the identification of the sequence. So you need to really go very deeply. So the very, very large sets. And this takes time, unfortunately. So uh, I would suggest to use it for small fragments if you really, really need to get it. But I think that the iterative approach, when you first identify the canonical base pairs, and then refine the model and finally go to the non-canonical ones, uh, will be the most useful because then knowing the sequence, knowing roughly the position of the basis, uh, can be also much easier to identify it with standard approaches. Because again, this backbone based approach is quite right. So <laughs> it cannot be as accurate as, uh, as the other methods. Okay, I think there's another question that popped up. In, uh... Ah, it's about recording. Okay. Ah, okay, PPT, okay. Should I share the PPT or? Uh, if you want, we, I think yeah, we can put it somewhere. But I think the video, it's okay. I think all the, all the slides are there, so I don't know. Uh, but yeah, video which will be published soon on our YouTube channel. So yeah, I don't see more questions, I think. So Grzesiek, that was great. I think great introduction to your tools and we see each other in two weeks and hopefully there will be a place when I can just go and check all the fixes and all the things that people think about given structures so I don't have to run all the tools <laughs> but yeah uh, you, maybe like you I'm need to play with the data it's much easier nowadays so so uh it will get uh, browser based at some point. So, yeah. but if you run. just want to, you know, grab all the models and just do some machine learning or something like that, you don't, I guess, want to, you know, go again one by one. But, but as, as you pointed, like, you know, for AlphaFold, that was not a problem. So maybe to some extent you can just yeah. ignore it. But, but there are problems uh, that cannot be solved even in AlphaFold models. So I have a few examples of, of errors in uh, sequence assignment, errors in proteins. That cannot be solved with alpha fold. So this uh, my favorite one is of beta propeller, which is uh, rotated by pseudo symmetry axis, and uh, it has completely random sequence as a result. And uh, and this things like that happen, and you cannot rely on an automated approach because there are simply too many possibilities uh, for automated approaches mm -hmm. to consider. No, no, no. What I meant that the alpha fold was trained on this, you know. Uh, error structures and it was still and it works so you know still works you but never know. it's because 200,000 structures in PDB I think that's the that's the that's the trick okay so then there's a question yeah, okay. would you recommend Sorry. combining alpha fold with method yeah yeah of course so that's that's what we all do so alpha fold and experimental data <laughs> I, think that, I don't think it makes sense to, to, to build structures on scratch nowadays. <laughs> At least that well, we don't do it in Hamburg. So we always assemble models from other structures and just fix bits and pieces locally afterwards. It's much faster, much better. And the statistic is much better, of course. So the validation is uh, much easier to go through with the other models because they are better. <laughs> nice. Crazy times. With the structure prediction that works. Now okay. it's uh, <laughs> time for your contribution. RNA structure prediction is needed. <laughs>